Good evening. You're joining us live on Facebook for this month's episode of Science Stream, which is brought to you by Great Tech. Welcome. We'll be starting our podcast in a bit. Meanwhile, please make yourself comfortable. If you have any questions for our guests, please leave them in the comments section. See you shortly. Once again, especially to those who have just joined us. I'm Sean from Techland Penang, Penang's very own science discovery center. You probably must have heard of the zombies, virus infected walking corpses, which do not have a mind of their own. Although human zombies are not real except in science, sci-fi, movies and drama series, zombie crabs and shrimps do exist. And the mastermind behind it all is a tiny parasite. This group of parasites are microscopic creatures that are known as rhizocephalans. Rhizocephalans do not have any limbs and internal organs, except for reproductive organs, some muscle tissue, and a simple nervous system. How can these simple and tiny creatures gain control of the crabs and shrimps that are much larger and more complex? Dr. Kaur Wai Ho and Dr. Fazan Hanafia both who are lecturers and researchers at University of Malaysia Trangganu will share with us more about zombie crabs, the effects of rhizocephalan parasites in this episode of Science Stream, which is brought to you by Great Tech. Dr. Kaur Wai Ho works in the field of aquaculture, especially on crustacean with productive biology and physiology. Dr. Fazan Hanafian is working on aquaculture breeding and biotechnology. Both of them graduated with PhD in the field of aquaculture from University of Malaysia Trangano in the year 2016. Based on a paper they published during their PhD, they were offered and spent two years postdoctoral at Shantou University, China. Now, they are serving as contract researchers at the Institute of Tropical Aquaculture and Fisheries, Ecotrop, University of Malaysia Trangano. Dr. Kaur focuses primarily on mud crab culture and ha has published more than 40 research articles in the span of five years with two science letters in 2020. In addition to mud crab, Dr. Fazan works uh, with other crustacean species as well and he has more than 35 research articles between 2016 and 2020. Together, they have established solid global networking with more scientists in the field of mud crab fisheries and agriculture. The story of rhizocephalan parasites, however, started during their PhD journey. It was an accidental discovery by Dr. Kaur and Dr. Vasa during their annual survey of mud crabs at several common fishing grounds around Malaysia. Not knowing what it was during that time, they documented the strange phenomenon. After so many dead ends, they managed to get hold of a rhizocephalan expert from Norway, and from there stems their love for this unique creature. Without further ado, please join me as I welcome Dr. Kaur and Dr. Pazan. Hello, Sean. Thank you for inviting us, uh, Tech Dong Penang. So I'm Dr. Kawai Ho from the Institute of Tropical Aquaculture and Fisheries, University of Malaysia, Japan. Welcome to the science stream, Dr. Um, Kaur and Dr. Yeah. Fazan. Uh, and thank, thank you for inviting us. I'm, I'm Fazan Anafia, and I'm from the same institute with Dr. Waiho. And my work focuses more on crab genetics and breeding. I see. So there are many publications which both of you published together. How did the both of you start working together and continue that collaboration to this day? Actually, we started working together since our PhD degree. We registered under the same supervisor, Professor Mohamed Ikwanuddin from UMT. And the main thing is the research interest, which focus on the mud crabs. Even though uh, we conducted different speech, uh, research during our PhD, but our research are interrelated with each other. 
and easy for us to change idea, design, uh, conduct and manage the experiment and write the manuscript together. And plus, we always uh, collected the extra data during our sampling, which give us bonus and more opportunity to publish extra papers. Yeah, I think like what uh, Dr. Fasan has said, uh, it all stems with the same interest and enthusiasm in solving problems. So, and the problem is one problem often lead to another problem. And there, for example, like the stumbling of the rhizocephalon monocle mic crack, something that we is totally unexpected of, but due to our curiosity, we go and pursue this further and we contact other researchers from other places and institutes. And fortunate enough, we have moved on the right door and slowly learn more and more about this amazing uh, creature. So before we proceed further, I'm sure you would also like to know the views from our live audience. So we'll be conducting some uh, polls tonight and the first poll that we have for tonight is why do you think risos of learnings would be interesting to know? Okay, so this is your own personal uh, view. Uh, is it A, to save me from accidentally eating them? Uh, B, broaden my knowledge on the amazing features of life. C, so that I can teach it to others about this. Uh, D, so that I can be a citizen scientist and inform researchers if I ever encounter one. Okay, so let us know what you think below and don't worry, no one can see what you've answered, not even us. Okay, so of the many publications published together, there is this article. <laughs> Frontiers uh, or Young Minds, titled Zombie Alert, How Does a Tiny Parasite Turn Crabs Into the Walking Dead? Can you tell us why this article is different from other publications? Okay, yes, the Frontiers for Young Minds article is kind of a unique article. It is an open access scientific journal written by scientists, but unlike the normal uh, research article, this article is actually in a simpler language, meant for kids and young adults. Interestingly, it is also reviewed by themselves too. For example, our article was reviewed by kids aged of 8 to 13 years old. Yeah, and then um, from, from the reviewing, uh, reviewing process, we got back some really interesting comments from the, uh, our kid reviewers. So from for a start, the, normally the journal will start off asking a series of questions to the young reviewers. So we have listed out only some of them, some that we find quite interesting. For example, the journal asked them, what is this about? What is the article about? And what did the authors discover? So one of the reviewer, the kid reviewer actually answered, um, to gouge their understanding, they actually answered it quite correctly. So it says, the article is about parasites, Sacolina bio 40, that infect the host mite crabs and plant roots inside them. They discovered that parasites control the crab as if the crab was like a zombie. So to mate, the female parasite grows its reproductive organs outside of the crab's body to grab the male parasite's attention and create babies. So the parasites also makes the male crab gain the characteristics of female. And then another question that is rather uh, fascinating is, so the journal asked them, why is this discovery important, especially for kids their age? So the reviewer answered, it could help us learn more about crabs and the parasites. And it is also helpful in understanding change in the anatomy of crab. And if the parasite could affect other animals too. So this enable us to learn how simple organisms can do such intensive tasks. And then an another inter interesting question is, so they are asked, are there any questions we would like to ask the authors about why they did what they did? So some of the uh, questions uh, involved uh, includes, what are parasitic materials? So because we mentioned it in our manuscript, so they asked us, what are the parasitic materials? How did the authors got so close up to crabs to examine them without the crab eating them? Now this question is totally, totally uh, caught us off guard because we didn't even expect something like this because we thought everyone knows how 
but apparently for kids, it's, it's a different mind for them. And then the third question will be, how do we help you in documenting more of these cases? And number four is, does this parasite affect all crabs or just the family of my crabs? So we had a really fun experience revising our manuscripts to make sure that it actually fits into translating what we found uh, to the next generation. And it kind of teaches how to tell stories again, and which I think is quite a valuable ex experience for us researchers. So um, why walking dead? Are they considered dead or almost dead? Well, um, not really dead or almost dead, but more like I could, maybe I could put it like um, brain dead because the host, or which in this case is the crab, will be functioning according to the parasite's will. And it is basically just a house for the parasite. So the parasite will grow inside of the crab. And this is why once infected by these parasites, scientists call the infected crabs as zombie crabs because they are not themselves anymore. So to some extent, the parasite gain control of the crabs in terms of morphology, their physiology, and also their behavior. So that is why zombies are not just in the movies and the stories, but they exist also in real life. And the mastermind behind all these are just a tiny little parasite. Uh, let's look at the poll results. Uh, all right. Okay. Looks like a tie between uh, to save themselves from accidentally eating them. Okay, we, we will look into that, that. You know, if it's actually saved, we uh, we have we, we will address that uh, later in the, the show. Uh, broaden my knowledge on amazing features of life. So no one is interested to teach another person, uh, and also <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to become a citizen scientist. <laughs> Or, or maybe they don't understand what what does that mean yeah yeah but i think later we'll come come into come into citizen scientists as well yeah right uh, can you tell us a little more on how small are these parasites and how they can actually invade something a thousand times larger than them okay uh, let, let me explain to you uh, this parasite are called rhizocephalan parasite or parasitic manacles and their size is very small, about 10 times smaller than a grain of rice. They infect other uh, crustacean species such as shrimp and crabs and cause remarkable morphological, physiological and behavioral changes. Interestingly, they themselves are crustacean too. They are crustacean actually. However, they are considered as among as most highly specialized an extremely divergent form of parasite in the animal kingdom. Adult parasite is lacking almost all uh, typical crustacean characters, which they are lack of segmentation and appendages, and only possess a root-like network called interna for nutrient absorption, which spread throughout the host body and the reproductive organ known as externa. Uh, this externa is visibly protruding from the host abdomen. In fact, it is the morphological characteristic of uh, larvae that originally disclosed rhizocephalan as crustacea within Chiripedia. However, unlike larvae of other barnacles, uh, rhizocephalan larvae possess advanced and highly effective mechanism to infect their crustacean host. Now I, I will explain about the life cycle of this parasite. As shown in the figure one, each female sacred only infect one host. They will just infect one host and its life cycle start off with the free swimming nauplius and free stage with predetermined sex. Once the free uh, swimming female cyprid settle on the cuticle of a host, it will pierce through the whole skin using hollow cuticle and force stylet and transfer the parasitic material called vermigon directly into the host body system. Female cyprid are able to settle on a newly post mold host of various life stages, ranging as early as megalope to mature adult. 
after the successful uh, successful infection, rhizocephalin develop an internal root-like system called interna within the host and the female reproductive organ, and then develop the externa outside the body, the host body. It grows kind of uh, root-like structure, and it has many small fine rootlets. The interna generally uh, develop around the mid gut and grows along the intestine of the host, serving as the sole trophic organ of rhizocephalin to absorb nutrients from its host. Although rootlet uh, might extend and reach other organs such as hepatopancreas, however, the highest concentration of rootlet is found in the ventral nerve cord. And for your information, the time from secret infection to emergence of externa varies greatly among species. Some species need 33 days, and some species need up to 216 days to develop this externa. After the emergence of externa, the acquisition of male cyprate is critical to ensure the externa continues to grow to adult size, mature sexually, and reproduce. When oocyte within the external mature, they will be fertilized by the sperm produced by the wild uh, males within the receptacles. After the release of the several broods larvae, the external will reduce in size and eventually weaken off living scar on the abdomen. This is the full life cycle of Um So, how serious uh, could it get for the crab? If yeah, it uh, gets infected by this parasite. It, yes. Um, if infected, uh, the crab, the crab do get a little weak and also less uh, motivated compared to healthy ones, and then they'll have, as uh, my colleague Fasan mentioned, they'll have the externa on the abdomen, which is the female reproductive organ of the parasite, but. But following infection, the crab will have uh, a series of changes, uh, morphological changes, physiology, and also behavioral changes. And aside from the emergence of external, the second most notable changes after infection is the change in the external morphology. So the most radical changes induced by these parasites are often observed in males, where they will change the outer appearance of a male crab into a female-like uh, morphology. So instead of a male uh, abdomen, which I will show later, they'll possess something uh, more or less like a female abdomen. So even um, even local fishermen get confused with sexing infected crab. And um, the most primary changes that they induce, yes, is the primary and secondary sexual characters, as you can see in the figure. So as uh, the parasite exerts control over their host after infection, much of the host energy is directed towards the parasite instead of its own growth and reproduction. So the primary sexual character, such as the male gonopod, which is the copulatory appendage, as you can see in picture B, labeled with G for gonopod, and also the female reproductive organ, the gonopore, uh, as you can see in picture D labeled with GP. So these are considered less useful for the parasite's reproduction. So they are significantly reduced. And the gonopods in males are often found to be really, really short in length compared to the normal ones. And in some species, the infected females might even lack the opening of a gonopore. Thus, they can't even copulate, and that means they can't even mate and reproduce the next generation. So these change traits eventually lead to infertility of the infected host. And another, another obvious changes or transformation is the change in the male abdomen into a female-like uh, broadened abdomen in the crab. So in the induction of a broader abdomen in infected males by the parasite is thought to serve as protection for the parasite, uh, especially the parasite's egg, the externa, as you can see in the uh, in the figure where we mark with a red circle. So this is where it 
the usually the female will carry their eggs. So the female eggs will emerge from the same site. So the, the parasite actually um, lay their eggs at the same place where females crab would normally lay their egg at. So, and then although less common, changes in the abdomen morphology of female of some species were also reported. With those infected with smaller or larger abdomen compared to the normal mature female. And besides their sexual characters, uh, there are also other changes such as in body size. So after infection, the parasite would affect the molting mechanism of their host. So crab will stop molting in most cases after uh, the emergence of external. And smaller body size was often reported in infected crabs when compared to those uninfected. But however, most of these studies were field observations and controlled experiments. And I'm um, sorry, and control experiments, are, we are still lacking those in study. So uh, we, are, we are still not so sure on how far or what is the extent of the host, uh, the parasites have on the host body size and growth. But at least we know that they will affect uh, their molding mechanism. So uh, does the parasite invade only the digestive organs? Uh, what about the brain? Uh, does a crab uh, have a brain to begin with? Yeah, uh, this is a good, good question. Now, uh, let's see. So after forming internal within the host, uh, as Fasan has mentioned, rootlets will start to grow and reach out to nearby organs. So although not definitely, the rootlets of this parasite often reach and wrap around organs such as brain, testis, ovary, and hepatopancreas. And yes, like us, crabs and shrimps do have brains. So it is believed that apart from brain being involved in nutrient adsorption, the root system of rhizocephalon parasites are also important in inducing the various morphological, physiological, and behavioral changes in host. So the degree of organ invasion actually depends largely on the various different root systems of rhizocephalon parasites. Some species have extensive root system and it spread to almost every part of the host body, reaching to all internal organs and most appendages. While the root systems of other species is less extensive, where it penetrates only the outer shell and also the hepatopancreas, but it never even reaches uh, the uh, reproductive organ. There are also some species that are extremely simplified and their root system is just a small bladder, bladder shape uh, root without any rootlets and occupy very, very minimal space. So for example, in the left picture, uh, the internal of a species of a rhizocephalon mainly attach to the nervous system of the shrimp. Whereas on the right picture, you can see a different rhizocephalon species uh, has its internal rootlets attached to almost all organs of the hermit crab. So it includes nervous system, hepatopancreas, and also the reproductive organ, the testes. And the second, the second picture on the right shows how extensive the root system of the parasite internal can be that is shown in the green color. So it actually spread throughout the hermit crab's body and to almost all the uh, internal organs. And then, um, so besides uh, organ invasion, it actually causes, uh, it actually degrades uh, the internal organ that they infect as well. So the most popular organ that they infect is the reproductive organ, the testes and the ovaries. So we conducted um, some experimentation on uh, Saculina bio 40, the parasites that we found in my crab. And we found that has, uh, mostly testes and ovary are often reduced in size in those infected hosts. And female crabs are generally more affected than males. But it also uh, varies from species to species. So normally, rhizocephalic infection will affect gametogenesis, which is the production of healthy sperm and ovary. 
uh, in both testes and ovaries of infected hosts. So they normally cause sterilization in hosts after infection. So generally, although testes remain intact, it will be reduced in size and also have a lot of rootlets surrounding and penetrating it. So you can see this in figures C and D. In the infected crabs, all the normal sperm cells diminish and the parasites' rootlets can be seen in the testes, where I think it's too small, but we label it with uh, RT. And it also causes lesions on the ovary and also it destroyed the ovarian wall. So it resulted in oocytes being scattered and also it has a lot of direct rootlets to absorb the nutrients from the ovary. So the effect on ovarian tissues could be so severe that all the ovarian cells were disintegrated and no ovaries could be found. So just like in figure E, that is a normal ovary of a female crab with oocytes and eggs. But after parasite infection, you can see in the last figure, figure F, that the ovarian tissues basically uh, basically disintegrate the whole uh, reproductive organ, the whole ovary. And maybe I'll talk a little bit on molting as well. Like just now, uh, I've mentioned that it will affect molting. So molting is a process where it is essential for crustacean to grow, to grow in size and also to mature. But after infection, rhizocephalans actually capable of hijacking this process and use it for their own benefits. So in most cases, molting in hosts would be interrupted after uh, the emergence of external. And researchers also found that the infected hosts had higher energy expenditure. So this is justifiable as the host need to fill not only their own metabolic needs, but also the parasites. Okay. Uh, in addition to morphological and physiological changes, uh, the behavioral changes also induced in hosts following rhizocephalan rhizo infection. These behavioral changes are more prominent in males, in males as they tend to exhibit the behavior of unique to spawning female. For example, both sexes of succulinin infected crabs bearing externa migrated to deep water, which is a normal behavior commonly displayed by married female in preparation for spawning of the mud crab. The host control mechanism of uh, rhizocephalin causes the host, both male and female, treat the parasite like their own eggs. Among the maternal behavior includes regular abdominal ventilating and grooming and also cleaning of the abdomen and externa. Once the external matures, now fly will be expelled from the external by repeated contraction and expansion motion, while the host will exhibit natural spawning behavior, such as tiptoeing and ventilating the abdomen to aid in now fly dispersal. Rhizocephalan infection is also known to affect the host respiratory and feeding behavior. The oxygen consumption of infected swimming crab calinectus was significantly uh, increased from 57% to 139% in addition to reduced swimming capacity. Some crab species also showed slower reaction to the presence of prey and decrease of food consumption after the infection. So the parasite is able to uh, control the behavior of the infected Crabs. And we, you, you have mentioned that morphologically, uh, there are also changes. Uh, will this parasite affect the crabs genetically? And will it cause uh, the crabs to eventually die? The parasite actually gain control on almost all aspects of the crab host. And the question, will the parasite affect the crab genetically? We do not know yet, but our study shows that it could affect uh, the gene and protein expression of the crab. It can alter the expression of immune and growth-related 
genes in crab after infection to ensure their own survival. And to answer the last question, the parasite will definitely weaken the crab, but it won't cause uh, the crab to die directly because it needs the crab as host. However, if the infection get out of hand and the crab population might be troubled because once infected, the infected crab cannot mold and reproduce and this will be bad for the whole crab population. If, if the parasite is so tiny, how does it actually exert its control over the host? Yeah, rhizocephalans. Yeah, this parasite, although it's tiny, um, we have a we have a few colleagues from Russia that actually studies uh, the potential control center of um, of this parasite. So we thought rhizocephalans are thought to exert control over its host by controlling uh, the nervous system. So researchers found that they are special rootlets around the central nervous system of the host. Also, there are neurons surrounding the body of the parasite. So as you can see in figure A, number one is the rootlets of the parasite, and it actually fuses with the neural fiber of <coughs> neural fiber of the host, which is number three, and also the muscles of the host, uh, which we label as number five. And figure B shows a clearer picture of the fusion with only the parasite rootlets and also the crab's neural fibers being highlighted. So these rootlets penetrate inside the nervous tissue. Also, as you can see in figure C and D, two different parasites, but both showing their internal rootlets growing and attaching to the crab's neural fiber and body of neurons. So these neurons form a special network around the body of the parasite. This phenomenon is also considered as a potential site for interaction between host and parasite. So as crustacean nervous system is known to control various biological functions from locomotions to behavior. So scientists believe that rhizocephalans might actually exert their control over hosts by targeting these sites of direct contact. However, however, there are still so many things that we do not yet know. For example, the molecular mechanisms of these interactions. So by far, uh, this paper was published in 2020. So by far, this is the closest we get of a clue of what are the potential control center of uh, rhizocephalin onto their host, which we thought, we think that it will be the control of the nervous system of the host. Right. Uh, for those who have just joined us, uh, we have Dr. Kaur and Dr. Fazan from University Malaysia Trangganu with us on tonight's episode of Science Stream, which is brought to you by Great Tech. So now having heard so many negative things about this parasite, Let's have our next poll. Is rhizocephalans something bad? Okay, so is rhizocephalan something bad? A, yes, it causes harm to the crab population. B, no, it is just ensuring its own survival. C, yes, if it affects crab pawns, then the whole pawn will need to be discharged. Okay, so let us know. Uh, what do you think? Click on the buttons below to let us know, right? Okay, so in January, we heard how the clownfish has a mutualistic relationship with the sea and moon. In this episode, the relationship is obviously a parasitic one. What does the parasite gain and what does the crab lose? Mm, parasitic relationship is never a good relationship. One side takes advantage while the other side suffers. For the parasite, it gains home, a place to grow, to reproduce, and to ensure their own survival. But for the crab, life is bad. Once infected, the crab's external feature will be changed into female-like. Their internal physiology, such as organ, will be underdeveloped, and their behavior will be disturbed as well. They will lose their identity, and they'll uh, 
and they will and they will now have only one function to be a baby making machine for the parasite so do the parasites infect female and male crabs equally or is it you know there's a preference for you know male crabs only or female crabs only or how yes so the parasites actually infect both gender because they actually just did the host the crabs or the prawns or the shrimps as like Pasan said as a baby making machine but however its effect such as feminization is more obviously seen in male so this is true because females female crabs female hosts already have all the essential equipments to carry babies and the crab would just need to trick the females into thinking that the eggs that they are taking care of is their own eggs. However, for males, male crabs, for example, the parasites need to change the outer morphology of the male abdomen into female-like. And also they need to change their behavior as well so that the male will actually take care of the parasite's egg like how a female would. So yeah, both sex of the host of the crabs will be infected by the parasites but the the one that we normally get uh, get exposed to are males well actually for females they exist as well but then just that we are not uh, we are not sure that they are infected or not because it's not so obvious compared to male crabs so if you are you, you do not know if they are infected or not right um is it safe for human to consume you know infected crabs so because you can't tell right so mm. what happens if humans do consume the parasite and you know is the parasite capable of getting inside humans if not through consumption okay uh, during the first encounter of this parasite the fisherman mentioned to us that the yellow sack is is the crab eggs I bought the crab and cook it and then the crab is full of meat it is good but the yellow sack is definitely not the crab's eggs due to the weird shape there are no report mentioned about the effect of this parasite to human but since we will cook the crab before eating i think it should be no problem to us no problem at all. okay all right Let, let's see how the audience responded to the poll Okay, so well, no. It seems that a lot of people think it's it's okay. They don't blame. They don't blame the. <laughs> they don't blame parasite. the parasite. Yeah. So, uh, but there's there's also some concern that you know if it infects the, the crab uh, ponds, then you know there's a huge loss. So I'm not sure. Maybe we have some uh, farmers in <laughs> the audience. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, are other animals also targeted by this parasite, or it's only crabs? Just now you mentioned, you know, how many crabs and things like that. I'm, I, I do see um, in your pictures just now. There's also prawns. So, uh, do we have uh, only crabs, or you know? Okay, uh, Rhizocephalum parasite infect other crustaceans as well. So yes, they also infect other members under crustacean family. We have seen report of Rhizocephalum parasite on shrimp, lobster, and prawns. And then the infestation of Rhizocephalum may seriously affect a population health, especially in already severely depressed population due to fisheries. With increasing fishing pressure, the general preference of harvesting is only the health and large individuals and the sterilization effect of effect of rhizocephalon on, on its host cause the percentage of infected individual in a population would increase dramatically so right uh have then these crustaceans evolved or developed at least a mechanism to protect themselves from this parasite or they are all bound to be uh, baby making machines if you just say <laughs> they are infected by this parasite. <laughs> so, uh, so far, we have not yet come across any evidence that might support 
uh, the development of a mechanism by the crabs or by uh, by the host to protect themselves from the parasites. But these parasites are quite species specific. So there are researchers that tested the parasite's specificity by, by exposing the parasite to different crab species. And they found that the crab, uh, the parasites will only infect the species that they chose to. Like just like in our case as well, uh, in the case of mite crab, there are three species of mite crab within the same population, population that we found. But the, uh, the species that was infected by the parasites is only one species, which is the orange mite crab. So this shows how specific the parasites is, and it won't actually infect others, other uh, species other than the one that they prefer to. But um, so far, we have not yet found any evidence of a defense mechanism by the host. And also, uh, we have not yet found any cure for if, if it actually occurs in, in pond and so on, on how to get rid of this parasite. Let's have our last poll for tonight. We still have some uh, topics to cover, but let's have our last poll for tonight. Uh, what will you do if you encounter a crab infected with rhizocephalon? Okay, so let's just say you now that you know about rhizocephalon, maybe you know how to identify it already. So what would you do? Uh, would you release the crab back to the wall? Will you kill the crab, you know, or, or any of the crustacean? crustaceans uh, uh, that has become the host or will you remove the parasite from the crab and release the crab okay. so you know what you have to do choose your option below right uh, okay so does this parasite pose uh, pose a problem to agriculture farming is there a way to prevent this parasite or uh, control this disease Yes, uh, this will definitely pose a problem to aquaculture farming nowadays, especially if the targeted aquaculture species is crustacean, and the species has reported a uh, report of rhizocephalan infection before this. And this is what we found in our study, rhizocephalan in mud crab within our country. It will impact several aspects of crustacean aquaculture from broodstock selection to breeding program. In terms of broodstock selection, the main effect of rhizocephalan infestation has on crustacean aquaculture is the reduction and growth of cultured crustacean species. These parasites normally have long incubation, incubation period within its host after infestation before the host starts to display any visible external morphological changes and the emergence of external. Thus, there is a high risk of accidentally selecting infected individual when sourcing crustacean from the wild for aquaculture purposes, such as obtaining crab root stock from the wild. Uh, further, unlike males that will undergo feminization, females show minimal external changes and without thorough examination, they would easily be uh, mistaken as healthy individuals. Hence, unknown uh, to farmers, this infected female would not be viable to stop because internally they have uh, degenerated. I mean, the ovary is gone and non functioning gonads. Another possibility is that farmers might also mistakenly recognize the infected males within externa as female with AIDS and bring them back to the pond. And then for crab culture, in crab culture, they have like uh, crab fattening, which uh, which uh, use crab in the process of harvesting juvenile, rearing them in a, an enclosed or fence environment and selling them of after they are fully grown or show significant increase in body weight. This process will be severely affected by an outbreak of rhizocephalan parasite. And this is because infected crab will have lower body size low, uh, or weight due to unable to mold and decrease in feeding behavior, and thus crab fattening uh, would surely unsuccessful and farmers would suffer a great loss. This also may affect the soft shell crab industry in the future. Right. 
so uh, I think maybe I can touch a little bit on the the what what are the practical recommendations if if it happens in uh, aquaculture settings or if you find it. So uh, <clears throat> until today, like I've said just now, uh, there is no known antidote to treat rhizocephalan infected hosts. However, there are several methods of identification and prevention that are currently available. So to prevent the spreading of rhizocephalans into aquaculture facilities, uh, the first step would be to correctly identify infected individuals and to avoid selecting them. So the most obvious characteristics of rhizocephalan infection would be based on the presence of externa. As you can see in the picture, uh, the crabs and prawns all have externa, that is the yellow sac under the abdomen. So that is the most prominent feature that you can identify those infected with this parasite. Now, when an external is absent, the second most notable characteristic is the change in external morphological characters, feminization, especially the reduction in size and length of their sexual organs underneath the abdomen. The severity, the severity of this feature, however, vary among species, and thus, we actually need to have enough knowledge on the effect of rhizocephalan infection on each host species of interest before we actually can diagnose it correctly. So another useful method is uh, to use molecular method, uh, which is polymerase chain reaction, PCR. This method enables us to identify parasitized individuals well before the manifestations of any external changes. But then it requires us to actually sacrificing the host to extract the internal organs for diagnosis. So this method might not be too suitable for large scale screening of individuals for aquaculture selection purposes. But once infected individuals are identified, it is advisable for us to actually kill them instead of discarding them back to the wild. Now this is because uh, those infected crabs are already sterile and they would not contribute to the spawning stock population. But instead, they will only serve as live incubators for their rhizocephalan parasite. So by discarding these infected individuals and only collect the healthy ones, we will actually significantly affect the host population dynamics and increase, and increase uh, the number of infected in individuals. So if an infected individual's very mature externa was accidentally brought into the aquaculture facility, they will actually develop into cyprids and also readily infect other hosts. So once an infection is successful, it is also in, almost impossible to reverse the infection except for us to kill, kill off the infected host. So if it happens in, in a pond, normally what is advised is to dispose of all the crabs and disinfect the exposed facility, either its pond or tank, to prevent further infection and also to minimize loss. So let's see, actually, uh, we, we did ask uh, <coughs> what uh, the audience would uh, do. So let's see uh, what has, if, is it as per what you have said? So uh, majority say kill, kill the host. Uh, and uh, a portion says to remove the parasites from the crab and then uh, release the, the crab back. So you were saying that you know uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't do that uh, because they are already uh, yeah. the factories maybe making factories already. So uh, even if you get rid of the parasites, uh, they are still pro. Yeah, they are ready ready to be one. So yes. Uh, um Maybe one thing that we can uh, actually highlight is that like, if this is a crab and, and this part is the external, even if we, what we can see is just the external, and the external is actually just the female reproductive organ of the parasite. So even if I remove the external, the internal is still within the host. So it can still grow back another external. So there will be no point of just removing 
the external unless you can also remove the parasite from within but it's almost impossible because it is already fused with the central nervous system and all the other organs so i think uh for now what we can advise is if you found one then you just kill it off yeah they always kill them instead of discarding them back to the one if let's just say you were to uh, try to remove, you'll probably end up killing the crab anyways, since it's already part of the nervous system. Yes. And then um, they actually has a report in China where they... Okay, uh, China is famous for Chinese meat and crab, the hairy crab. So the hairy crab is also infected by this parasite. So I think they actually, um, the farmers harvested, I think, like 10,000 or how many thousands of crabs from the wild, and then they stuck it into a pond. So at first glance, uh, all the crabs are healthy. But after uh, half a year, six months or seven months after rearing, they notice that there's an rhizocephalan outbreak. So all the crabs, almost half of the crabs started to show uh, symptoms of feminization and also they produce externa. So uh, what they do is they actually kill off the crabs, but they found that they can't, uh, some, some escape. So they misidentified mis, uh, some. But to their surprise is that although the misidentified crabs managed to spawn uh, babies from the externa, no, no, sorry, uh, the, those with externa cannot spawn because they actually need a, a male cypress to uh, to fertilize the eggs inside. Yes. So uh, what happened, what saved that farm is they use their own uh, circulating water so they don't obtain water source from the wall. So from that, from, that, uh, from that way, they actually ensure that within the water itself, there's no uh, male cypress. Because only females infect, only the female parasite will infect the crabs but the male parasite will be free living in the water, waiting for an externa to fertilize the externa. Mm. So, so there's a way to manage it. Lah. Yes. All right, so we have a question from the audience. Okay. So <coughs> Jun Kai Ong asks, why is there such a huge variation in the length of time from when the crab is infected to the growth of an external. Does this have anything to do with its immune system, if it has one? Okay, um, maybe I can shed a little bit on this. Um, it depends, uh, basically the variation in length is depend on, dependent on the infected parasite species. So within that species, species itself it doesn't vary much let's say if species a uh, needs one month to produce uh, from infection to the production of external then all the other species uh, all the other members within that species will have more or less the same time frame but uh, the variation between the parasite species i think most probably will be uh, the variation in each parasite species the way they infect because as, as we've seen just now, even the organ invasion stage is different for each parasite. Some might invade more extensively, some is just a little bit on the surface, just enough to cause uh, the changes that they want. So I think uh, more it really, for a certain extent, depends on the individual parasite species and also their, their mechanism on how they infect their host. And I think also, as the audience mentioned, I think it will also greatly depend on the host internal uh, immune system as well. Okay, right. So it looks like we need to wrap things up. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaur and Dr. Pazang for spending your time with us in the past hour. We thank you for your sharing and hope you and everyone at University of Malaysia Trungano stay safe and healthy always. Thank you for inviting us, Tech Dom, and we have a good good session with you, man. Thank you for inviting us.
That's all we have for tonight. Thank you for being with us since 8 p.m. We'd like to thank Great Tech for sponsoring this episode of Science Stream. Techdom Penang will be reopening tomorrow from 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Do come experience the wonders of science and technology at Techdom Penang. See you again next month for another episode of Science Stream, which we will be talking on COVID-19 vaccination. Good night and stay safe.